I'm Sarah Boisvert, and I come from manufacturing. I owned a laser manufacturing company. We invented and manufactured the laser for LASIK eye surgery. We uh, manufactured laser machine tools that were used to make all kinds of things, um, particularly in the medical device industry, things you hope you never need, like coronary stents. Um, and I sold that company and was labless, and MIT took me in. And so I was in Cambridge at the Media Lab at MIT. Um, if you don't know about the Media Lab, it's probably one of the more creative places I've ever been in my life, and I've been some pretty crazy places. Uh, it is um, uh, profiled on 60 Minutes, and if you have a chance, uh, if you Google 60 Minutes and MIT Media Lab, there are some amazing stories of the work that our lab does. Uh, my particular lab was the Center for Bits and Atoms, and um, Neil Gershenfeld uh, started that lab. We do a large <coughs> number of contracts on, uh, for big companies like Boeing and Airbus. Um, but he also founded Fab Labs, and so Fab Labs are digital fabrication laboratories that are around the world, and we have about 2,000 labs. Um, and when I left MIT and really wanted to spend more time on workforce, um, I opened my Fab Lab here. So my Fab Lab is called Fab Lab Hub, and uh, that is the commercial part of our business where we do contract manufacturing for people and CAD design for people using uh, CNC machining and laser cutting and, and 3D printing. And that's how I fund our education programs. Um, besides getting grants from uh, wonderful partners like Ready New Mexico, which is part of the Department of Workforce Solutions uh, here in, in New Mexico. Um, and what else? Those, that's kind of my story. Um, so 3D printing was invented in 1983 by uh, a man named Chuck Hall. And um, Chuck built a kind of 3D printing that I'll discuss in a few minutes that is called stereolithography. It's a laser-based process. And I can show you later. Uh, we'll have a little tour of our lab. And we have, uh, I think, three stereolithography 3D printers. Um, so 3D printing is um, often called additive manufacturing because we're adding material. And it's just like cake decorating <laughs> um, where you've got a pastry bag and you go through a tip and you just build up something. So like um, on these cupcakes or if you see, I can't believe the beautiful things people make with um, cake decorating, you know, the flowers that they do. But they start with a lower layer and they just keep building up. And that's basically what 3D printing does. The difference is that it's the computer that tells the um, machine where to lay down the material. So instead of you know, me holding the pastry bag, it would be like a robot holding the pastry bag and putting the material down in the right place. Um, this kind of digital fabrication also applies to subtractive kinds of activities like um, CNC machining, so routing where uh, you have a drill that takes away material and um, that's the more common kinds of digital fabrication that was invented at MIT in 1954. Um, but this is a completely different way. The similarity is they both are driven by uh, CAD files. So they're both driven by computer designs. And what happens is the design tells the computer either where to take away material in the case of laser cutting or CNC cutting or where to lay down material. So you're either, and, and it will say things like, it's almost like the ones and zeros of computation, you know, uh, lay down material, stop, lay down material, stop. If you've got holes or you've got uh, designs like on here, you can see on these glasses where it has areas where there would be no, no material laid down. So it is a, um, 
uh, a newer form, but still has been around for decades and has just started to come into people's consciousness because the machines are becoming more um, uh, reliable. And because they're more reliable, they're now getting into more mainstream markets. And also the price of the machines are coming down. So we're starting to see lots more 3D printing. Um, so there's different kinds of additive manufacturing. The kind that we're going to learn about is extrusion-based. Extrusion is how they make PVC pipe, for example. It's, that's how you do cake decorating. You're extruding material. Um, and I can send you all the uh, slides. Actually, we could probably send the recording afterwards. Um, but uh, extrusion is the kind of printing that we are going to uh, be working with. And it's uh, FDM is, is what it's called, and it's fused deposition modeling. Um, it has other names too. Alec, isn't there, a, there's another term. Um. I won't think of it because yeah. I don't use it very often. FDM's probably, I mean, definitely the most common. Yeah, FDM is the most common. And that's the most common for the kinds of printers that are tabletop and that tend to be more inexpensive and that you find in schools or in maker spaces um, because it's affordable and it's, a, it's a, 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 um, an easier process. It's a less complex process. So it tends to be what we use um, in education. Um, however, you can make some pretty cool stuff, and so this bracelet was made on an FDM machine. Um, Ella, could you go and get the molds, some of the molds from the stereolithography yeah, uh, totally. printer? And um, yeah. Um, Stereolithography, similar to photolithography, which is used to make chips, um, is a process that is laser-based, and you have a liquid. And so the liquid <coughs> is then uh, changed in its chemical composition by laser light. And the laser light typically takes the liquid and turns it into a solid. It still does it in that layering process. <clears throat> so it will uh, solidify and change the bottom layer and then kind of grow from there. And um, those are more expensive machines because you've got lasers <coughs> in them and you've got a, a more complex process. So everything is gonna be more expensive. The original stereolithography machines were probably $100,000, and we have one back there. Um, but uh, some students who did their PhDs with our group at MIT uh, came up with a way, thank you, mm -hmm. came up with a way to make um, a, a smaller, more affordable, affordable version, and we have two of them back in our lab. and. Uh, it, it, the company is called Form Labs, and um, those sell for about thirty-five hundred. And so you're talking about now, really, again, opening up your market uh, to a more sophisticated kind <coughs> of process with higher resolution. So this is; these are some molds that um, were made, and I'll pass these around when I get to jewelry. Um, but you can do quite a lot, you can do direct printing, but you can also um, print molds. And so the, one of the other processes is selective laser sintering, that's typically metal-based printing. Um, metal-based printing is not quite there yet, I don't think. Um, we have a million dollar machine at, at, at my lab at MIT that only works like part of the time. Um, it is such a difficult process. Uh, for a while, when metal 3D printers first came on the market, they were uh, catching on fire a lot. Um, <laughs> their laser base, it's pow a powder, and a lot of those metals are flammable, and you put laser light on it, and you have fires. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you can do titanium, uh, Boeing, and, and GE aerospace, do a lot of metal 3D printing. Um, I've had 
a lot of requests from the aerospace industry down south um, looking <coughs> for people who have um, metal 3D printing experience. Um, there are some smaller machines that were again designed in, in Cambridge, uh, uh, a real hotbed of, of uh, uh, 3D printing development uh, by a company uh, called Desktop Metal. And I hear theirs are coming along. It's about a $250,000 machine um, that has higher reliability. But still, metal 3D printing is um, needing a lot of development work I, from what I'm hearing. There's also, uh, now we're seeing lots of other different, there's something called BinderJet that um, HP came out with. So now we're seeing many different kinds of methodologies for achieving the same thing of laying down material. Um, so as I talked about er a little bit earlier, um, you start with a design file and um, what we're going to learn in here and what we're going to use for our projects is basically designing our own uh, using programs uh, like Tinkercad, which is where we're all going to start because that's a program where we can have fast success really easily. And as Trace demonstrated in our last uh, boot camp, um, we're really able to do some pretty sophisticated kinds of projects. Uh, Trace designed a, light, a miniature lighthouse with Fresnel lenses, um, which is uh, a sophisticated uh, program. Uh, or a sophisticated application. Um, we also had someone who uh, designed um, micro robots with articulated joints, and articulated joints are difficult to do. So you can do quite a lot in Tinkercad, but it's also uh, not a steep learning curve, and that's why we're going to be able to kind of jump on that and, and produce some things real quickly. But there's other programs as well. Um, when you get into things like Fusion 360 and SolidWorks, they tend to have uh, things like laminar flow analysis. You're able to do electrical analysis. Um, they, they have quite a lot of advanced capabilities that, that um, you don't always need, um, but are handy sometimes when, you, when you're designing things. And I talked to earlier about Thingiverse, and there's other places where you can download shared files, like um, Enable, the Press That I Can company I'm going to talk about, or nonprofit I'll talk about later. Um, you can download Press That I Can uh, files online, and I should have brought my hand in. I don't know if I have one here. Um, but there's there, there's a lot out there. You have to be a little careful when you download shared files because sometimes they don't work. Um, Thingiverse has a very good system of having comments. So um, you know, people will say, "I tried this file, but you know, you have to modify this or that in order to get it to function." The other way to uh, get started with printing something is through 3D scanning. And um, scanning is a process that basically takes uh, something that is uh, existing and turns it in almost like taking a picture, but it's a digital picture. And it's a, uh, put, you then have to manipulate the, um, the scan in order to turn it into a .stl file, which is the file format we use. Um, but it still uh, translates really well for things like reverse engineering. So uh, museums like the Smithsonian have 3D printed. I think they've done most of their collection now. If you've ever been to the Smithsonian and know how big it is, um, that's no small feat. They've been working on it for like 10 years. Um, for the anniversary of Apollo 11, they, three, they uh, scanned the command module, and um, <laughs> you could have your very own model at home. Uh, and one, you know, one other one that comes to mind is these friends of mine, uh, and I think I talk about it later, who are, do a lot of scanning for the film industry, which of course we have in New Mexico, and it has uh, gotten to a point that the uh, logistics for blowing up things like the Colosseum are just not possible. Um, you could 
perhaps recreate a whole Colosseum, but the easier thing to do is to go to Rome, 3D scan, and a company called uh, Direct Dimensions in Baltimore um, did this for the movie The Avengers, and they 3D scanned the whole Colosseum so they can get, and they have very high-end equipment, so they can get all the detail. Then they 3D print it as a small model, and then you blow up that. So not only are you saving cost of making the model, you're also uh, uh, having less uh, safety issues with with your uh, with your team um, because of um, just the scale the scale of it. So the big question is then, when do you use 3D printing over other technologies? And I'm going to talk about each of these in, in detail, but it doesn't make sense to always use 3D printing. Rapid prototyping is uh, one of the first of the applications. Actually, I used to go to a rapid prototyping conference that I've gone to for now you know, 30 years. And um, it's become a 3D printing show. It used to be a, a much more diverse, but 3D printing is so perfect for rapid prototyping. It's faster, it's cheaper. Um, you can do a small batch in a, in a very quick way. The, um, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this uh, in, in the next couple slides, but um, it, when you, when you go to make a million of something, like people say to me all the time, you know, why don't you sell your earrings? But, you know, they, I, I shudder to think what these cost, um, you know, in my time and in how, how long it takes to print. So it takes like seven hours to print a little square of them, maybe that has 16 earrings. Well, you know, that's that's not economical. If I wanted to be in the jewelry business, I would make a mold and I would send it to China and have these made for half a penny a piece with injection molding. So, um, but it's great for me having one. But if I wanted to make a prototype where we've got somebody who is like the, our, our customer who is doing the medical device, um, it's fast and easy. He doesn't have to make a mold. A mold w can cost, you know, I was looking at making some antimicrobial masks during coronavirus and the mold was going to be $40,000. So, um, and I, I didn't really need millions of them. You know, I, I needed, I needed, you know, maybe thousands of them. I just couldn't amortize the cost of the mold over the price of, of the part. And, and the masks, you know, obviously, even, even the N95 masks don't sell for enough to justify the cost. So rapid prototyping, though, is particularly interesting because you can make functional models. And um, Alec, I hate to do this to you guys. I should have planned better. But will you go get some of no, these guys? And you know yeah. what? Bring anything else that looks interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, what, and I'll pass this around, but when we 3D print this, it 3D prints um, the entire piece and it, it, uh, the gears rotate coming right out of the machine. And unless you have somehow messed up your design um, and, and they stick, you know, that will tell you that you've messed up your design is if they don't turn. But it comes out of the machine just like this. And that is because you're, you're laying it on top of each other. So there's no assembly. And I'm going to say that again. There's no assembly. So think about the cost reduction in terms of labor. There's also the cost reduction in terms of um, uh, inventory carrying cost. So now, instead of carrying, what is that, four, five, six, seven parts, now you're carrying one part. You're also, so you can pass around cool. those guys. And let me just see what else you've got. The little <laughs> hands. Oh yeah, I'll take those. And like this is like another dual material. Yeah, but we can pass them these. Um, 
And that one spins. That's a logo we did for a company in Denver. And they wanted to give, it was right before COVID, sadly, and they wanted to give them away for um, uh, keychains. <laughs> uh, so now your, your, your carrying costs are less, but also the other big thing, they in the class have ideas about what, what this impact would have on the final part of having it all printed as one? You can't say because you know. <laughs> yes. It would print far faster. Um, it might, but I'm thinking the final part, not about the process. Uh. So, if I was going to assemble this, what would I have to use to assemble? If I had all these gears, anybody else? You have to have the tools. I don't know if that with the process or you can lay down and function over out of the, whatever machine, depending on what you're using it for, you can either just package it and send it off. Right. And you'd have to have uh, like um, nails, or you'd have to have welds, you'd have to weld it, or you'd have to have uh, screws, like those little center mm -hmm. things. You'd have to have connections. And what happens when we have connections in things? There's a tendency it might not quite print properly, so it, the whole thing is fast. That's true, and if you think about like stuff in life that breaks, it usually breaks at the connection points, right? It's when your nail fails or your screw fails. So anytime we have to use nuts or bolts or screws, you now have something that's not as strong as when you have something that's a solid piece. Mm -hmm. And so um, Airbus has told us that, uh, or rather GE, GE uh, Aerospace has told us that they have, some, they have this famous uh, leap engine, and the leap engine, they're like the poster child for metal 3D printing. They have spent trillions of dollars on this. Um, and they have this little nozzle, and they 3D print the nozzle. And the nozzle went from 20, I think it's 20 parts down to four. And so now you've got on an airplane where stuff falling, you know, pulling apart due to stress factors of either speed or um, any of the other things that happen when, you, when you're going fast in the air, um, those stress factors are eliminated. And so now you've got um, a piece that is much, much stronger. So it has just a, an amazing number of benefits in terms of how we deal with um, rapid prototyping. This is a, um, an example of a prototype I did for the city of Indianapolis for an awning. And we weren't really sure, I was working with an awning company, and we weren't really sure if these little white connectors how many, how many of the little, um, uh, not gears, what are they called? Bearings. Bearings. The bearings, thank you. Um, how many bearings we needed. But we could, in 24 hours, we could 3D print one of those little white pieces. A machine shop told them that they could machine one for them in four weeks. <laughs> and we could do it overnight. So we really sped up their process and we, we developed like three or four different ones and they were able to choose the one that worked the best. It had to withstand 25 mile an hour winds. It's, it was outside and it was to cover like an, a, a pedestrian walkway. And um, it, it sped up their delivery because they had like some outdoor events happening and they, you know, they had deadlines. Um, the other time that we use um, 3D printing is for mass customization. So by that we mean where you make thousands or millions of something where each one is different. And earlier we were talking about dental, and so dental and medical are applications that come into play in mass customization because every human being is different in very small ways sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
And so in, this is a little old number, I should look up again, but this number is probably three or four years old, that um, 200,000 medical devices are 3D printed in the US today. I, I would bet it's much more than that. So the Invisalign dental braces are all 3D printed. Um, most hearing aids are 3D printed. Um, so obviously the uh, dental braces, the benefit is it fits exactly onto your teeth when you're talking about orthopedic kind of applications. Um, it cuts down surgical time, and so the insurance companies like that. And more and more hospitals are getting uh, 3D printers, not to do the stuff you see on Grey's Anatomy or shows like that, um, not so much printing organs, but printing things like surgical guides um, for hip replacement and knee replacements, um, printing models for pre-surgery where you can take a CT scan of the tumor and then you can print a model and the surgeons can go in and not just think about uh, a way to take it out, but actually try something and see where the, where the problems are. So um, the VA hospital in Albuquerque is the lead on a national VA uh, program for 3D printing and um, has a, quite a sophisticated 3D printing lab. So um, lots of applications in the medical field. <clears throat> These are prosthetics. Um, the ones on the upper left, my laser manufacturing company um, 3D printed the inner ear bones for um, a group in, uh, I think they were in Poland. Um, these things for, that go over prosthetics, I believe are called fairlings, and the woman in the lower left has a whole uh, uh, collection of them to match her outfits. And so now it's not just something practical, it's something that is really a, a fashion statement for her. And so now wearing her prosthetic leg is not the psychological barrier that it, that it used to be. Um, this is part of that Enable project that I was talking about earlier. Um, it does not give children or adults fine motor control, but it gives you gross motor control. You can th throw a ball, you can pick up a Coke can, you can, as you see Max is doing here, you can balance on your handlebars. Max's dad uh, is the education director for Enable. Um, you couldn't uh, play the piano, but you can at least hold the bow for, for playing the cello. It's a wonderful nonprofit organization um, that, that does a lot of good for a lot of people, and they're international. Um, again, talking about compliance, um, body braces. So this is a brace that is made of a pliable material, uh, a, a kind of a plastic that has flexibility. And um, they were finding that girls weren't wanting to wear the braces that they uh, used to have for scoliosis with the, because they're just so ugly. And um, this goes, as you can see, under the clothes and is actually pretty. And um, it increases the amount of compliance that um, patients have. Um, Again, keeping with this theme of mass customization, Disney has a whole program where you can have your child scanned and have a doll made and bring that home to your parents or your grandparents. And um, uh, I don't know if any of you saw The Big Bang Theory where Wallowitz, this is just one of my favorites, uh, where Wallowitz and um, the other guy, uh, the, the Indian guy from, oh, uh, yes. Um, they decided that they wanted to have little action figures of themselves, and so they sent away, and they came, and of course, Krathapali says, but my skin tone isn't my beautiful skin tone. So they decide to get a 3D printer, <laughs> and, and uh, they, they print themselves, and Wallowitz takes home his, his uh, figure of himself, 
and his wife goes, oh, honey, it's just so cute. And, the, and then she finds out, you know, what it really costs them <laughs> to make this. <laughs> and, um, but, that, you know, I, I guess that Disney has probably found some way to do production in a faster way. <clears throat> um, there was a big business in Japan of wedding cake toppers. So you, instead of those generic dolls, you can have yourself and your spouse. Um, but the one I really like is this ring. So this is made in, in titanium. This is actually a direct metal 3D printing, and it's the couple's fingerprints. So that's, I thought that one was, was very clever. Um, the other extremely interesting thing about um, uh, 3D printing is that uh, we can make very complex geometries and um, we can make things that you could not make any other way. And I guess I'll pass around this bracelet. So if you really look at this, it would not be possible to machine this. Um, I'm trying to think if I have, can you get the white bracelet? Oh yeah, the, the bigger one. The big white one, that one really shows it very well. Um, so Airbus is a customer, or uh, I guess a customer uh, of our lab at MIT, and they are seeing 55% weight reduction. So you can only imagine with aerospace how important weight reduction is. And it's because they're able to create these complex geometries. So the part on the right by, from Morse Technologies, which is now a part of GE, used, that used to be a solid part. and if you look through it, it looks like you're looking through a forest. And it has the same strength and the same functionality as, as it used to have as a solid piece. But you can see the amount of weight reduction that there is. The piece on the left, yeah, that one shows it even better. Oh. It's a little easier to see. Um, the part on the left was part of a, um, a challenge that GE uh, Aerospace did. And the part on the left was the old part. And you can see how the new part has quite a lot more empty space. But you couldn't make those empty spaces with machining. It's, it's really only possible to do it with 3D printing. Airbus also told us that not only did they have weight reduction, but they had a lot less waste. And so if you've ever been in a machine shop, you know, the floors are covered with either sawdust <laughs> or our other lab has a, has a big router, four foot by four foot router, and there's always sawdust everywhere. And, or, or met, if you're cutting metal, you have all the shavings. And some of it can, well, the sawdust can't, but the, um, you know, the metal you can recycle sometimes if it's the right material. But this way, you're not having to do that. You put down the layer and, and away you go. Um, and so these are, so the other thing you can do is make molds for casting. We do this with the stereolithography printer. Um, and the mold is on the left and the ring is on the right. This was designed by Maita Cardenas, who is an artist and jeweler in Santa Fe. And she designs in CAD. She um, never graduated high school, designs in CAD. This is the Taos Pueblo. Um, and I'm going to pass around my smaller version. I used to try and wear this ring, but it's like a weapon. <laughs> and, and so I got her to make me one that is um, actually practical, that I can wear. Um, so I don't have the, her molds, um, but I do have some other molds. So, oh, here's the bracelet. So this is the mold. And then her husband has the casting company, and this is the bracelet. Um, that one might be a slightly different design, but you'll get the idea. And this mold is a belt buckle. Mm -hmm. Is this from Jeff? I'm not sure. That was before my time. I think that might be Jeff. He's a Native American jeweler that we know. Um, and then I will start my ring over here. So the reason that Maita 
uses um, uh, 3D printing. She could uh, do this by hand in wax with hand tools, but it takes a very long time. And she is a business student. So by designing in CAD, we can, we can continually print out molds for her and increase her productivity so that then she can spend more time on um, doing things like selling and going to art shows. Just be sure I get that. <laughs> I'll, I'll know where it is. <laughs> um, you can embed electronics. Voxelate is a, a company I've known a long time. Jennifer Lewis is a professor at Harvard. And she has a machine where you can lay down two different kinds of materials, where you can lay down plastic and you can also lay down uh, the electronic traces and then you can put plastic on top and have it embedded. There's a company in Albuquerque called Optimac and Optimac does something quite similar to this. Um, I think their machines are actually built in Minnesota but their, many, their sales office and their headquarters is here in Albuquerque. Um, you can 3D print art. Um, the piece on the right won uh, an art show that I curated uh, many years ago in Maine. Uh, this is a, uh, I think he's Dutch, or, or maybe he's, um, he's either Dutch or Belgian, uh, but he's definitely in Europe and does, if you get a chance to look up his website, he does full-scale, huge sculptures that are 3D printed that are quite beautiful. Um, Henry Segerman is a professor that I met when he was doing his PhD um, at Oxford, I think. And he now teaches at uh, Oklahoma State. And he takes differential equations and other math equations and turns them into 3D printed objects. And so this is a differential equation. This is from that same art show I curated. And um, he's able then to teach his students math by allowing them to see what it looks like in real life. And I think that math is so elegant and beautiful in this really, I, I love that piece. Um, this is uh, Jay Leno showing Tom Brokaw how he is 3D printing replacement parts for his antique car collection. Um, at the time, he was, I think, 3D printing molds, like what you're seeing, and then they were, they were casting in metal. But I've heard since, since I did this that I think he has a metal printer now. Because he probably can afford staff who can keep it running. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, what we really see in 3D printing is that we can democratize um, production. So we can take small printers <clears throat> like what happened in COVID. And so we had thousands of people around the country 3D printing face shields and 3D printing masks. And um, it was um, typically, you know, people with their little printer like what you're going to learn to use. Um, it is uh, changing the economies of scale. Um, and, I, and I think it's really um, opening up more creativity because we can do so much more with it. So now for the downside. <laughs> so the downside, is, number one downside is speed. Um, 3D printing is not fast. <clears throat> and um, it is changing rapidly. Um, our, our production 3D printer that you'll see when we do our little tour uh, upgraded our uh, stereolithography little printer and it went from being able to make say 10 in 24 hours to being able to make 100 in half an hour. So that's a big difference. Um, HP, I think that number is now like 150,000 parts. Um, they're break even against inject, uh, injection molding. So um, it used to be that, you know, if you wanted more than one or two, you, wouldn't, you had to go to injection molding. Now we can keep pace 
price-wise up to about 150,000 parts. So now when you're weighing whether to do 3D printing versus um, injection molding, it's not just a matter of price and speed. It, it has to do more with other kinds of factors like the design and the complexity of the design. Um, but it's, it's clo that gap is closing. Um, spatial wear solution, the, the smallest I've seen is 10 microns. Um, my laser, um, the laser for LASIK, uh, can make a hole that's one micron, so a micron. To give you a sense of scale, a, a hair is 70 microns, 70 in diameter, and I can make a hole one mi I can actually make a half micron, but I can't do it repeatably, but I can repeatably make one micron holes. Um, I can't do that in 3D printing. Um, uh, the CAD design um, issues are that you really have to understand design for 3D printing, um, and that when you, it's not just going from 2D to 3D, you really have to think through how the machine is going to process things. So again, on my earrings, um, you know, doing something with extrusion, um, you know, now I know, and I know I can't make holes of that size and have it work, because now I understand 3D printing. This is one of the first things that I, that I built in extrusion. I was used to doing stereolithography, which could, could have done this, but it was too expensive to do it, so, and it couldn't do it in color. Um, also, every machine has its own machine code. So when you take um, a design file and need to send it over to the printer, um, it needs to be converted into a language that the, that the printer understands. Kind of like going, in the old days, going from the Mac to the PC, where you take a, a Word document and there was just no way they could talk to each other. Um, and it's kind of the same thing. Um, but what's annoying to me is that almost every machine has its own. There are some common ones, like Cura uh, is one that we use, a slicing program that can be utilized by different machines. But some companies want to have proprietary um, software, so you're, you're having to use theirs, whether it's as good or not. Um, the .stl file format is the format we s it's kind of like when you think of, um, you know, .dox or when you think of .pdf, it's the file format. It was designed by Chuck Hall, so it was designed ages ago, decades ago, and was designed before we could print in multiple colors and in all the materials that we can print in now. So we can print in about 300 different materials, and it doesn't always work well, like particularly on the metal, the metal, and you have to do a lot of um, machinations to get it to work on some of the exotic materials. Um, and it's not the Star Trek replicator. So what happens is, like, if you want to print metal, you need a different printer than if you're going to if you're going to print plastic. You, you can get, like, there are some extrusion 3D printer me, uh, filament now that, like, has metal embedded in it, and it's kind of shiny, but, you know, you can't use that on an airplane. The FAA would not count that, right? So if, you, if you're really wanting to, to make different kinds of things, you need a lot of different printers. And uh, I'm not seeing that change anytime soon. Um, so I end up... Um, integrating 3D printing with other tools. This is from my laser company. This is a microfluidic device. That wave is, uh, I think, about 100 channels that are about 10 microns in diameter. Um, but the uh, bigger piece was 3D printed, and then we just laser machined the really, really fine work that we needed into the bigger part. I couldn't I couldn't get the lines to, to work um, there are people putting together hybrid machines um, I don't think I have a picture of this but um, I was at a conference and they did a car they 3d printed in one week they 3d printed a little car and which was very fun to drive a picture somewhere of me driving this little car it only went 30 miles an hour um, 
the uh, there's a lot of stuff happening uh, that's in the news, like NASA uh, printing on the space station. The truth of it is, they don't do anything. The machine is up there. Uh, a company called Made in Space controls everything from the Earth, and and when something goes wrong, you know they tell the astronauts what to do. But typically, the astronauts don't really do anything except stuff like this of pulling it out and having a photo op. Um, so it's, I mean, they are printing up there, but it's really Made in Space that's doing the work. Um, there's a lot of talk about 3D printing food. Um, the main applications are not so much, because I look at it and I think, well, you know, 3D printed chocolate's okay, but I mean, you know, what's up with that? Um, but if you have old sick people who, like my mother, couldn't ever keep track of her um, diabetic diet versus her heart disease diet, and, and you know those are diametrically opposed. And so if she could have had something where her nutritionist could put a, a, you know, a formula together and then 3D print out a hamburger looking thing that, you know, then she wouldn't have to think about, oh, is it low fat or low sugar? She could get it right. Um, these are beautiful pieces. This is from Hershey's, the one in the middle. Hershey's had a project with 3D systems. Um, I love those cake toppers. The Hershey's ones tasted terrible because they were so full of sugar, they were so sweet, and it's because they weren't able to print, uh, they needed the sugar content in order for the prints to work, um, and I, I know a company now on the East Coast that's just um, worked a lot on this with some of the high-end chocolate companies, and now they're actually getting good tasting chocolate compared to the one I tasted. Um, those. Cake toppers at the top actually were delicious, and they tasted like fruit. Um, this is from uh, this is all sugar, and this is from an artist, um, Joshua Harker, in Chicago. Um, the other application is that when the astronauts go out to space, and for all of you Big Bang Theory fans, remember when Wallowitz was freaking out because he was in space for so long? One of the big things they say is that they miss home. They miss the things you're used to as a human. And so if they could print pizza or print things that uh, would make the astronauts feel, or someday people feel more comfortable, then the long stretches in outer space would, would be more tolerable. Um, Bioprinting is not there yet because typically they can't print the blood supply. Um, there's been advances out of, I think, Columbia last year, uh, Columbia University Medical School, um, on uh, printing uh, arteries and, and veins. Um, but they can print tissue, and the beauty of this is that you use the person's uh, own stem cells or the person's own um, uh, uh, genetic material, and so then you don't get the rejection that you get for the um, transplants, plus the endless supply, because then you just print it, you're not waiting for some poor person to die. Um, <coughs> it took seven years for us to get the laser for LASIK through FDA approvals. Um, I think this would be on that order because you're, you're doing something that is invasive to the body. And so um, the FDA approvals are going to take a long time in, in, in this field. Um, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, I think. Um, no, no, it was in the New York Times, like in the last week by this company, Icon, um, that they just printed a whole village in Mexico. And um, obviously these are big printers, so these are giant, I mean they're like the size of this room, and the thought is then instead of shipping everything to the place, you bring the 3D printer in and use local materials. Um, it's uh, typically concrete based, um, but I'm seeing out of the Netherlands and out of Israel work on um, materials that are more eco-friendly and that have sand and that have 
you know, lo locally available um, organic material. I think the house is pretty cute. <laughs> and then, of course, guns. So um, everybody freaks out. All the lawmakers freak out about guns, that you can 3D print guns in your garage, and we're all going to have guns. Um, but the truth is <laughs> that if I wanted a plastic gun to take on a plane, I would not go to the $40,000 3D printer that printed this. I would go and I would go to a 1960s era machine shop and have them machine the parts for me. And it would take less time, it would cost less, and you still need the metal firing pin. So it, you know, there's all this stuff in the press, but I don't see that, you know, happening probably in my lifetime. Um, and to have a metal printer, I mean, it's, it's you know, not, not there. <laughs> but only for people in their garage, <laughs> right? Um, and so when will we be 3D printing everything we need in our homes? Um, there's a lot of people who, who really see the future, but I don't see this happening in my lifetime. Um, and the really, really big thing, I think, is the desire to make. So um, I, if I wanted to, there are great sewing machines out there, and I could sew my wardrobe, but I'm a terrible seamstress, and I would look like a bag lady, and, and I have no interest. And it's, I, 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 I'm not good at it, because I don't like it. I, I have no interest in it. And so you still have to have a desire to do it. I have lots of friends with gourmet kitchens who don't cook. Um, so you can have the tools, but you still need to want to do it. Um, and I think for the young people, for the digital natives, it is more um, natural. And um, but you know, I look at stuff like the maker community will talk about. Oh, you know, I can I can go make a little doodad to fix my washer, and and you know, I think about how long that takes by the time you reverse engineer it and scan it and print it, and I could just go down to Home Depot and buy it. It's different if you can't buy it. And so Dora, who is in the, was in our first class and is in the other room, uh, bought something for her shop that she couldn't buy the, the parts that she needed. So that's when it makes sense. But just to print for the sake of 3D printing, you have to see it as a hobby at this point in time. I mean, someday when we have uh, the advances in speed and materials, you know, that will change. But for right now, I think you have to um, kind of weigh what, what the options are there. So now we can have questions. <laughs> now